It's four o'clock. Dawn has yet to break over the Northumbrian hamlet of Harnham. Buddhist monks awoken for the first meditation of the day. When the abbot, the venerable Papakaro, came here just over a year ago, he was the sixth abbot to take charge of this British outpost of Theravada Buddhism. He had trained with the order in the forests of Thailand, and for 17 years he's followed the ancient way of life of a mendicant or a penniless monk, staying true to a tradition which goes back 2,500 years. The monks trace their spiritual lineage to the Buddha, the Indian prince who abandoned his life of wealth to become a wandering holy man. To Buddhists, he is not a god, they have no deity, but the enlightened one. They chant in homage. Their faith is a journey towards enlightenment, the supreme bliss of great spiritual liberation. At the centre of the practice is meditation and the quest for mindfulness, trying to be fully aware of themselves here and now. Buddhists are dedicated to the peaceful life, to bringing deep inner serenity to themselves and the world around them. Yet, 20 years ago, the venerable Papakaro, then Captain Gordon Cappell from Seattle, Washington, was one of thousands sent to Vietnam on a mission of destruction. He had trained as a helicopter pilot, but nothing prepared him for his first impressions of war, ones of shock. This was very real and real meaning that they were shooting real bullets and real people were dying real deaths. So I really felt a very, a very strong need to, to find something to, to, to kind of put a trust or faith or, 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 uh, in, like, like a refuge, a spiritual refuge, and so, of course, religion. Gordon Cappell was born 40 years ago into a moral but not religious family. Yet he recalls, around the age of seven, experiencing a kind of spiritual awareness. But having no way to develop it, he became a typical all-American lad, excelling for a while at baseball. As he approached adulthood, however, he became uncertain about his future. He tried various jobs, but at the age of 20, expecting to be conscripted, he volunteered for military service. Many young men of his generation did not return from the war zone in Vietnam. Others were dehumanised by the experience. There were definitely those that their hearts were really into killing, and in hardened would be the word calloused. And in war, it brings out, it can bring out the worst in a human being because one is given the licence to kill. I know for sure that I was, I killed one man. I was responsible for one man, another human being's death. I didn't actually shoot, but I was in, in control, in command, being the pilot, and, and I gave the order to shoot. I can look back with a very clear conscience and see that I was acting not out of, out of a joy or, or of that power of, to take human life. There's a free conscience in that I, I wasn't doing it because I wanted that, you know, that person to die. I was doing it because that's what I was trained to do. So it was more like a kind of deluded ignorance. When troops were given leave, they often headed for the flesh pots of Thailand. Gordon Cappell went there too, but he found himself drawn to the country's Buddhist heritage. He saw Buddhist monks for the first time. My first impressions were that I could never live in that way. I just remember one time walking in one of these, these beautiful places in Bangkok. I, 
kind of, I remember having, having a kind of shiver go up my spine. This is like prison. I could never live like that. And, and so it, it was a gradual, as I started to, from that intuitive attraction, I started to read, study, investigate, well, what is this about? And so this eventually came to the point where I thought, well, if one is going to live a religion and, and practice it, well, then one really should do it as completely and, and totally as possible. He persuaded the army to grant him a conscientious discharge, and his parents gave permission for him to join this Thai monastery under the revered teacher Ajahn Chah. He found monastic and army life were not dissimilar. The discipline, of course, is, is very similar in a lot of ways because our, our discipline is, is such that there is a, a sense of kind of spit and polish and getting up and, and timetables and all of that. So that aspect of it I, I like because that's why I, li I, I did like military life because of, I liked a sense of order and having things kind of defined in that way. But of course, one was, was giving up things then to become a monk, to give up all kind of worldly pursuits and pleasures and, and all the rest of it. So that there was a definite period of adapting, adjusting, and getting used to the kind of deprivation that uh, through the, the renunciation and the giving up of, of these things. After eight years as a monk, Gordon Capel, now the venerable Papakaro, took on his greatest spiritual challenge. He went to live in a cave as a hermit. It was one of the most trying experiences of, of my life so far. Um, I'm not by nature hermetic. I love people to be with people, and so I thrive in community. So I did it. One of the reasons I did it, I knew it would be good for me. I knew I had, something would, would come out of it. It came a, a point when I didn't have a good cry, or, and I don't mean just, just a kind of you know, a cry, a, a, a real weep, like to the ground, and just of, in total kind of utter despair. And it was, but there was an incredible kind of cleansing feeling to it, just like getting something out, you might say. And I can look back on it now and see it was this, it was this kind of purging, like a purgatory, which was, was a kind of temporary thing. But of course, during the time, it seemed like, well, you know, this is <laughs> going to be like this for forever. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world in Newcastle, a group of friends had come together to study meditation. Since Ajahn Chah had sent monks to Britain, Nick, Virginia and Richard thought they too would like a monastery near them. In those days they just had the one monastery down in Sussex, which is a long way from Northumberland. Uh, and it was my idea um, to, uh, to have a branch monastery. It was because I'd been to Thailand and I'd vin visited their monastery there. And there they have a great big monastery and little branch monasteries. And we imagined we could go and rent a little cottage somewhere in Northumberland, invite just one or two of the monks up to live there and support them all on our own. I remember once thinking, well, the best way to find a monastery is on foot and uh, setting out walking around Northumberland. <laughs> I actually did find a monastery, but it was of the Christian tradition, and it was really interesting just to see this is actually a, a part of England that has an old tradition of monastic living. So the, what we did was we, um, we just advertised, and John Wake replied. Um, I remember the day we went, it was really terrible weather, and it looked so dreary, and it was nothing to sort of inspire. And the next time we came to visit the place, the sun was shining. We happened to bring a monk with us who yeah. looked at us and said, I don't know what you're waiting for, it's perfect. Seven years later, the Hanum Vihara, or monastery, is well established. It's supported entirely by the lay community through a trust. John Wake, the monk's landlord, takes only 10 pounds a week in rent and has granted the monks a 50-year lease to give them security. He was born and bred here in the hamlet and does nothing but praise for his new neighbours. They would die of hunger before they would go to nearby and borrow something. One day they came in and I said, have you, what have you got in there? Have you been gathering mushrooms? Oh no, they might belong to somebody. They wouldn't, if you left a five pound note at the road, they wouldn't pick it up. They're dead honest. And they wouldn't even pick a mushroom up because they might belong to somebody. The monks' striving for spiritual perfection is reflected in their careful approach to even the most mundane domestic chore. But they're not allowed to prepare food. Their one meal of the day, to be eaten by noon, is prepared by novices and presented with due reverence. Most days they're joined for their meal by John Wake. 
although it may seem like a lot of ritual and, and things, it's, it's a way of, of respecting what we're given and a way of partaking of it, which is with, as we say, wisely reflecting, rather than, as most people do, just sit down and kind of gobble their meal without a, a thought of, of how it's got there. And so you find this in, in all religious traditions around, around food, a kind of a, a gratefulness, a thankfulness for what one is, is being given, whether it's being given in the form of alms like for us or whether uh, one sees that it's God sent. John's given a special dispensation to eat at a table. Does his friendship with the monks mean he's now interested in Buddhism? Not one feed a day. I want more than one feed a day. <laughs> what about the meditation, though? Do you ever join in on that? Oh, sometimes. Not to not to I go. I say on meditations, uh, well, we'll start with uh, half an hour silence. Well, that doesn't suit me, to start with. Do you admire their way of life? I do, yes. If everybody wasn't exactly like them, but, say, halfway, half as good, it would be a, a new world. In addition to leasing property, John Wake has also sold some buildings to the trustees who've obtained council planning permission to extend the vihara to provide new guest rooms, a bigger shrine room and accommodation for nuns. Get that double soaker there, no? Yet the monks' main work is not physical, but spiritual, contemplation, meditation and teaching. It's difficult for those with a Christian background to understand a religion without a god. And ideas like nirvana often puzzle visitors like these from a local school. Well, we've been taught that the aim of Buddhism is to reach Nirvana. So how could you compare Nirvana to heaven? I think probably the best way to, to answer is, is, say, in Christian uh, concept of like heaven and hell, uh, often is seen like an eternal state. Whereas in Buddhism, we see heaven and hell as, as, as not eternal, our kind of state, our transient states. Western languages may seem all too inadequate when it comes to explaining Buddhist concepts. Nirvana is more a state of being than a place and is achieved when a person succeeds in freeing him or herself from all the human impulses which make life unsatisfactory. ...is whole and complete and is like, is like perfect peace. So before you leave today we would like to, to offer a, a, a wee blessing and it's, it's a chant of protection. The monks are not confined to the monastery. They go out into the community, but travel can be a problem, especially as they're not allowed to have or carry money. If lay supporters can't provide transport, they must take the local bus, but they have to be accompanied to the bus stop by a novice who pays for their tickets into town. In Thailand, travelling monks are a common sight, but in Britain, shaven-headed and robed mendicants attract attention. Also in Thailand, monks go out every day to collect alms. In Britain, there's no Eastern tradition of giving food to members of religious orders, so the Harnam monks take their alms bowls to Newcastle once a fortnight for a symbolic alms round and visit the homes of lay supporters. At one, Nan Teep, a Thai woman now living in Newcastle, helps maintain the traditions of her homeland with her own graceful giving of food and flowers. Is that Mandy? Yes, yeah, she's coming. You're... Lay supporters call with their gifts. Some on their way to work, and others, like Mandy, on her way to school. <laughs> the monks collect food, both to take back to the monastery and to sustain them for the day. Are you in such a hurry we can't uh, offer a wee blessing? Okay, All yes. Right. 
After the arms round, Papakaro visits the university to take a meditation class. With so much contact with the outside world, were there any rules of the order which were especially hard to keep? I think a lot around sexuality, of course, are difficult, and especially in this culture where it's so kind of blatant. And so it's been the strongest drive in, in, in the human being. It's probably the most difficult to, to come to terms with. Um, do you still find yourself attracted to women? Oh, yes, most definitely women are, are you know, to, 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 say, to say no would be, would be you know, a very blatant lie. Papakaro's contacts with the outside world also include prison visiting. One of the Vihara trustees, Nick Scott, is the lay Buddhist chaplain at a local prison. And this is... Honorable Papakaro. Say again, sir. P-A... B-H-A... Yep. K-A... Yes, R-O. Thank you. Got that? Right. One has to be registered as a Buddhist before you can ask a Buddhist chaplain to come along and see you. So we go along for a visit. And anything from just listening to them, if, if, if that's what's, what's happening at the time, that they just need to kind of uh, shed a burden to talk to somebody about their, their difficulties, uh, or to giving them uh, advice on meditation, a guided meditation, because, of course, they're in a situation which is, is ideal for, for meditation and a contemplative uh, way of life, if, if they use it as such. So, shall we uh, have a, a wee sit? A bit of meditation? Yeah. Uh, do you want this question? No, no. no, no. Yeah. Yeah. The first visit was um, a lot of kind of cat calls, but Prabhakaro just turned around and greeted everybody with a smile and a friendly wave. And since then, there's been a lot of interest. People are attracted to, you know, the strength of character to be able to walk in this weather, in that manner, in a prison. I've mellowed out. I've learned to sort of face myself rather than run or react to a lot of myself or react to people around me and say, oh, I think the reason why I'm uptight is because of you. You know, I now realize it's happening inside myself. I just have to learn to adjust, to understand. I don't sort of imagine I'm going to come out of here and become a brilliant brain surgeon, but hopefully that uh, through my practices, that I'll learn to be a bit better adjusted person. And I just find basically every, every visit that, that he makes to the prison, it grows a little bit more. When Papakaro first saw monks in a Buddhist temple as a young American serviceman, he felt that to be a monk would be like being in prison himself. For 17 years, he has voluntarily kept the rules of the order. Does he ever feel, though, like making an escape? <laughs> oh, yes, that, uh, that comes periodically, uh, especially in the, the early years, but it's not, it's not like it goes away altogether. I mean, uh, I'm sure it can, can come maybe through, all through one's monastic life. Um, wanting to, to leave or thinking that one is still going to, to find something uh, that you, uh, uh, you know, the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow kind of fantasy or something. But it's, it's through those struggles, those periods of great struggle that, that one really grows and, and, and learns. So it's the trials, tribulations, which really, really give us strength. And strength comes from the community, both fellow monks, lay supporters, and the ancient traditions. The monks are now an accepted part of the local community. 
On their walks, they often visit the local parish church, and indeed, last Christmas, even went to the carol service. We inquired initially if, if anybody would be put off or offended, because we didn't want to go down as if we were kind of confronting people. It was just a gesture of, of kind of courtesy. We go to the church periodically just for walks and, and, and in a visit, because churches are very quiet places, and it's pity that people don't use them more. But do Buddhism and Christianity diverge in this major respect? While Christians teach that we should put others first, Buddhists appear to direct their spiritual efforts inside themselves. Before we can start to really, really love our neighbors, we need to take care of, of what's going on at home. So there needs to be, say, peace, harmony, and love within the home before we can even think about loving our neighbors. A philosophy which was put to the test two years ago, when Papakaro's father took his own life. The abbot returned to America to help his mother and sister. There was grief, there was sadness, uh, a, a period of mourning, and I think there's still mourning that, that, I'm, that I have to go through. But the way that, that I can see Buddhist uh, approach to life and, and the whole way of life and, and, and it's the attitudes uh, were, was so essential and helpful. And I was able to give an incredible support from my mother and sister. We have like meditations and reflections of, of death and dying, not a kind of macabre, negative kind of thing, but this is a very real thing because we were born that, we, that we've inherited with that things like death. Some Buddhists believe in rebirth. I wouldn't say I believed in it. I would say I have, I have an intuitive feeling that that is, is something that's a very high possibility that we've lived in the past, that we will continue to live in, in the future. But it's not essential to believe in that as a principle of Buddhist teachings, that one can refute it completely and still be a good Buddhist. When you look back to the things that you did before becoming a monk, for instance, when you killed somebody in Vietnam, do you these days have to go over that event in your meditation and prayer? I do, but not in the way of, of trying to be forgiven, but in the way that, that I completely open up to it, it almost daily. Do you think then that you've been able to cope with the traumatic memories of the Vietnam War better than many people who are in fact damaged psychologically mm. by it? Yes, I, it's, it's very sad. I've only more recently become aware of this because fortunately I was, I was, I was free of that for, well, I think many reasons. Um, certainly my, my monastic life and training and, 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 and Buddhism. At the center of the monk's way of life, are the 227 rules of the order. Every two weeks, having admitted their faults to each other, one of the monks recites the rules in the ancient scriptural language of Pali. Today, it's the venerable Nyanavira. When one monk is chanting the rules, it's very easy to feel very deeply connected to the tradition which has come down through two and a half thousand years, the lineage of thousands of monks down through the ages performing just this ceremony in exactly the same way. So consequently, it's very uplifting, very inspiring for the heart to do that, and a reminder of, of one's intention to live the holy life. I certainly can look back 15 years ago and see very uh, definite changes in myself. Certainly a feeling of more uh, contentment and, and within oneself, a more sense of that uh, being complete and whole and a very strong trust that I'm doing the right thing.